there is endless variety to the kinds of controversies you can encounter as a debater, which is one of the reasons that debating is so interesting and so valuable in education. But every case is based on some fundamental building blocks. It doesn't matter if you are arguing in front of the Supreme Court, your board of directors, or simply with your significant other. You must pay close attention to the process of building a good case in order to have a chance at being persuasive. This lecture focuses on describing the elements of a good case. Once we have these elements in mind, we can turn to focusing our attention on the specific demands that come from arguing for or against a proposition. We are going to review three key elements of a good case. Let us begin with the audience. The first element of a great case is that it is designed to appeal to the audience's decision making. There have been several important scholars of persuasion, ranging from Aristotle to Kenneth Burke, who helped pioneer some of the key concepts in the studies of rhetoric today. One piece of wisdom that has been critical to the study of communication for thousands of years is that you cannot build a case without thinking of the audience. There is no such thing as a persuasive message in the abstract. An argument may be considered brilliant for one audience and be totally rejected by another audience. Any of you who work with juries know firsthand that understanding your audience, what they value, is essential if you are going to persuade them. The boldest jury consultants will say that you cannot go to trial without knowing your audience and what will and will not be persuasive for that group of people. There is some discussion of whether or not defendants have a right to a trial consultant for capital cases. When it's a life or death situation, it is extremely important that you know your audience. For the purposes of our lecture, I want to emphasize the process of understanding and building a relationship with the audience. You need to help the audience to identify with you, with your side of the argument. According to Aristotle and more modern scholars like Burke, if a speaker is unable to create a relationship with the audience, then it is almost impossible to persuade them. The speaker works to create that identification, to build credibility, and to strengthen the influence of the arguments that he makes. Aristotle described this process of creation as invention. A speaker has to evaluate the obstacles that they face in any situation and then construct a set of arguments to deal with them in the most effective way possible. The audience represents the key obstacle to a speaker's goal, which is persuasion of his or her point of view. And in the context of debate, the audience is the final decision maker. So before you start constructing your case, you have to start with an assessment of your judge or judges. Take a moment and think about the organizations that you are involved in. It can be your work or your church or even your bowling league. Think of someone in that organization who is in a position of leadership and has to make decisions. It is important that you think of someone other than yourself. The exercise doesn't work as well on yourself because it requires an assessment that people can rarely do as well with themselves. Okay, now think about a moment when that person had to make a big decision. Ideally, something that was important and public. Have something in mind? Good. Now let's think through the specific arguments that they found persuasive. What were the principles involved? That is the key. If we want to persuade an audience, we can't just think about the arguments that they have found persuasive in the past and hope to repeat those arguments in every instance. What we can do, however, is step into their worldview and figure out what values and principles they care about when making a decision. This is a concept that is outlined by Burke as a terministic screen. A terministic screen is the set of language and symbols that a person uses to value some things in the world and to push other things to the background. For example, if your children participate in a youth sports league and the coach only wants to win, then they may not give every kid a chance to play in every game. For this decision maker, the value of competition and winning outweighs the value of fairness and participation. So the first key element to a great case is that it is audience-centered. It is designed to appeal to the values and principles that our audience of decision makers will care about. 
The second element of a great case is that it's well-researched. Good cases are built on the best available research at any given time. The world today is so different from almost any other time in human history because of the vast flow of information that is available to us at any given second. Certainly, many of you can agree that doing research on a subject today is an entirely different endeavor than it was even one decade ago. Almost anyone born during or after the internet revolution has grown up with more information at their fingertips than they could possibly ever absorb in three lifetimes. Indeed, debaters today have a much different task than they did when I started debating. For most of us, hard work was measured by the amount of hours a person spent in the library finding resources and using them to create debate arguments. The way someone knew that a person was a hard-working debater was that they were able to collect evidence for their arguments that no one else had. It was the debater who stayed in the library the longest who had the best chance of winning the big debates because they were able to find the rare study or quotation that could tip the scales in their favor. The great debaters today have an entirely different skill set. Rather than staying in the library to find one piece of information that no one else has, the best debaters today have learned information processing skills. We all have, quite literally, at our fingertips, the ability to access information on virtually any topic at any given time. And this has led to an information overload. The question now is not who can find the evidence, but who can sort through the evidence. In another lecture, I discussed the major types of evidence and work through the concept that good evidence is only good if it is applied in the right context. Here I'd like to focus less on the type of evidence and more on the evaluation of the evidence, which is important given our information overload. To that end, we'll review three characteristics that can help determine whether or not a piece of research is ideal for building a case. First, the venue that the research is published in is one of the clearest indications about whether or not the research has been vetted by anyone with a degree of expertise in the area. You have no doubt heard that many professors struggle with the demands of peer review. The phrase, publish or perish, reflects a difficult process of peer review that can make or break an academic's career. Ideally, peer review ensures that if information makes its way to publication, that experts in the field agree that it is a worthwhile contribution to the knowledge of that field. That is, it has something unique to say that can advance the conversation about a topic that is being researched. When I was a graduate student, I was struck by the harshness of the critiques shared by my mentors for the peer review process. Despite the warning of my mentors, I still remember my first rejection. I share the reviews with my graduate students so they can see just how vicious someone can be when their job is to make sure that only good arguments make it to publication. I assure you that if an article or book makes its way through to publication out of a peer review process, it represents one of the most rigorously tested modes of research available to us today. I can honestly say that becoming an academic requires thick skin as a person prepares himself for a life of anonymous reviewers who are trained to be critical of arguments. That is not to say that peer-reviewed publications are the only types of evidence that we should use when building our cases. Many of you in the business and professional worlds may not focus on peer-reviewed research for constructing cases. That being said, most of the research that is presented in business settings is, in fact, based upon theories that have their basis in academic research. Although customers and clients rarely ask for the footnotes, I think many of you would be surprised at how often data presented in the business world, ranging from market analysis to audience analysis, even measures of productivity, start from academic research and literature. If you plan to construct a proposal to make a significant change in your organization, you are better off consulting those foundational academic publications than assuming that a secondary source that is simply reviewing or using academic literature has it right. In my consulting work, I'm always excited when the executives want to talk about the larger academic concepts. I have found that most executives are interested in the academic literature as long as I can then translate those concepts into the practical, everyday decision-making. I have found that many of the executives I work with 
already have some understanding of the foundational assumptions and sometimes even enjoy reading the foundational work to make sure that they are prepared to defend the proposal that they have created. Of course, in the world we live in today, research is presented in a variety of other venues besides academic articles or books. With the click of a few buttons, anyone watching or listening to this lecture can create a blog that will give you a platform for making arguments for the public. More often, people have started to argue publicly through social media. What I find fascinating is how often people will cite something that they read on social media in a public argument. As much as I cringe when it happens, we must admit that people do share a tremendous amount of information 140 characters at a time. The key is that more of the rigorous review that a person has to go through in order to make an argument, then the more nuanced the position is likely to be. A person who hears something on the radio or watches something on TV, who immediately takes the social media to present their perspective, is far less likely to present a nuanced perspective than someone who has an argument that must be reviewed by experts in the field. So for the purposes of our goal to build the best case possible, we want to emphasize that nuanced claims generated from rigorously reviewed evidence are far more likely to be persuasive than the rant of a person furiously pounding on the keys on their phone. In addition to the venue in which the research is published, we should examine the quality of the piece of evidence based on the qualifications of the author. Once again, I want to reiterate that academic qualifications should not be the sole basis of this determination, but that some measure is essential for evaluating the value of the claims being made. For those of you in business, we often think of qualifications in terms of experience and success. That success can be measured in terms of growth or sales or the size of the team you manage or even the diversity of the sectors in which you've worked. For those of you all involved in medicine, qualifications may include the satisfaction of former patients with a new procedure along with the adoption of that procedure by a certain number of other doctors. For doctors who work in research institutions, qualifications may be defined by grant dollars how much, where the grant is from, and how long you know you will have it. For those of you all involved in nonprofits, it may be fundraising success and organizational growth over time. Similar to what we discussed in our lecture on evidence, the authority of the evidence is context dependent, so it is extremely important to select evidence that comes from authors whom the audience will hold in a high regard. We will discuss this in several lectures over the course of the series, but just to reiterate it here, Aristotle said that ethos, or credibility, was the most important variable in persuasion. If the audience doesn't trust the speaker, or in this case, the author, then the quality of the argument is greatly diminished. The third characteristic of evidence that we want to review today is the power of the claim. All evidence is useful insofar as we can apply it to support our final conclusion. This is what we refer to in the Toulmin model as the claim. When it comes to evaluating evidence, we must be aware of the differences between descriptive, evaluative, and prescriptive evidence. When someone attempts to research a subject matter for, uh, from scratch, they often find themselves struggling between these three different types of arguments. Descriptive evidence explains complicated phenomena. Imagine reading an article in a macroeconomics textbook that is attempting to explain the intricacies of a certain set of variables for the overall economy. Many of you no doubt en have enjoyed reading textbooks now that you don't have an exam waiting for you at the end of the semester. I'm always fascinated by how much more people enjoy reading textbooks when they realize that they won't be quizzed. They tend to read them to understand the concepts rather than to cram for the final exam. So in the context of our efforts to identify the elements of a good, strong case, we will need to use descriptive evidence if your proposal is going to address complicated phenomena. You could imagine needing this type of evidence if there is something occurring that has the potential to affect your organization but is difficult to see coming. In these difficult situations, you will want to focus on finding evidence that is descriptive in nature to help the audience understand what is happening before you can persuade them to do something about it. Evaluative evidence goes one step further. This type of research is less focused on explaining basic concepts and instead focuses on evaluating potential solutions. 
For those of you all in the business world, you may have studied this type of evidence through case studies. Case studies allow us to find other organizations that have faced a similar set of issues and then evaluate the success or failure of how they approach the situation. Evaluative evidence always requires some argument by analogy. We have a separate lecture dedicated to the strengths and weaknesses of arguments by analogy, but for the purposes here, it is important to remember that case studies only work if the audience agrees that your organization is facing a similar set of problems or obstacles. The second the audience says, but our problem is different, then the analogy collapses and the power of the evidence is lost. In my experience, evaluative evidence is most helpful in establishing for your audience and decision makers what has been done before. It is extremely rare that we discover something that no other organization or other leader has dealt with, and rarely have they dealt with it perfectly. Instead, given the power of hindsight, we find that evaluation or evaluative evidence reveals strengths and weaknesses so that we can reflect productively on the actions of others. However, it doesn't necessarily instruct us on what to do next. So now we have seen that descriptive evidence can help us understand a complicated situation and evaluative evidence can help us to know how others have approached similar situations. The last type of evidence is prescriptive. This is the type of evidence that most people in consulting are being paid to generate for an organization. Prescriptive claims are arguments about what an organization should do. It moves beyond description and evaluation to argue in favor of a particular response. The reason the consultants end up being paid for prescriptive evidence is because everyone wants the solution to be as tailored to the specific situation as possible. While it is fine to argue from analogy when doing an evaluation, if the decision is big enough or if the potential ramifications to the organization are scary enough, then the decision makers will want the prescriptions to be focused on their particular situation. My suspicion is that many of you have worked with consultants in the past and have had a variety of positive and negative experiences. I think that one of the things that I'm constantly struggling to articulate to prospective and even current clients is that I see my job as helping them learn the methods of decision making so they can better evaluate the prescriptions people bring to them. From my perspective, organizations hire consultants who give them prescriptive evidence, but they oftentimes don't know what to do next. Leaders ask themselves, do we take the full slate of recommendations at face value? Do we solicit buy-in from all the members of our organization for all the recommendations? Should we act on all these recommendations immediately? These are the types of questions I often hear people raise when they have the final executive summary in their hands. I believe that what they're struggling with in that moment is that prescriptive evidence is necessary, but rarely sufficient for good decision making. Executives end up with a set of recommendations but they are missing the descriptive and evaluative evidence from which someone in their organization can construct a complete proposal, which includes using the recommendations for what they are, evidence from an outsider that can be used to help construct a case for change. When someone in your organization constructs a proposal and cites the consultants to support it, then it requires an extra level of nuance to give the person generating and defending the proposal an opportunity to edit, add, or remove some of the prescriptions without sacrificing the authority or credibility of the consultants. In my experience, all it takes is for the consultants to make one recommendation that the organization disagrees with before the entire credibility of the recommendations is called into question. As a result, I have found that a vicious double bind ends up being created. Some consultants become afraid of making their recommendations too strong for fear that they will alienate a key constituency in the organization. In this case, what often ends up happening is that an organization pays for prescriptive evidence and ends up with something that is not very prescriptive at all. The recommendations are vague and rarely take on the core of the controversy. The other extreme is that the consultants make very specific recommendations based on what they think the audience of decision makers wants to hear. They conduct interviews and focus groups to determine who the key players are, and then they end up making sure that their final slate of recommendations mirror those perspectives. Now I want to be clear that this double bind does not apply to all consultants. 
There are brilliant companies that do fantastic work and use consultants productively and well. That being said, I want to emphasize again that organizations that hire consultants should be prepared to treat their final summary and their recommendations as evidence that should be used towards building a final case, but not as the final case. So to quickly review, we have to choose our evidence carefully. When we build our case, we want to make sure that we present evidence that is nuanced, qualified, and appropriate for the controversy of the proposal. If the proposal has been well-researched, then even the strongest opponents will not be able to challenge the proposal off the cuff. If they truly want to object, then they will have to dig into the literature and dig into the proposal to counter the basic claims with their own sets of evidence. The last major characteristic of a good case is nuance. You may remember we discussed the Toulmin model that nuance is a crucial component of argumentation because it insulates you from attacks a key concept that is especially important here, the qualifier. A qualifier is introduced when someone agrees that there is some limit or condition that needs to be applied to their overall claim. For example, the statement, debt is evil, is a broad claim that has very little nuance. If I were in a debate with someone and I said, debt is evil, then my opponent could reply that there are several instances where debt can be used for positive good, such as when the government uses debt to provide social services it otherwise couldn't afford, or when debt is extended to allow a person to finish their education. Outside of government, debt can be crucial for families in times of emergency or to simply buy a house. Additionally, debt may not be monetary at all. It could be a sense of being in debt to the people who went before you and were willing to serve as your mentors. My problem wasn't with the thesis of my argument. My problem was that I didn't have any qualifier on my claim, so I was stuck defending a much broader argument than I wanted to. An appropriate qualifier may have been, consumer debt is evil. Now my claim is more nuanced. It still doesn't resolve the fact that my opponent could point out cases where consumer debt, such as purchasing a home, is good, but it does get me out of having to defend the idea that every single instance of debt is evil, which is the implication of my original statement. Good cases are built on qualifiers. What that means is that a person defends the narrowest version of the claim that they need to in order to have an effective argument. For example, if a person is attempting to defend the legalization of medical marijuana, then they do themselves no favors by making their proposal grounded in individual rights and autonomy. If they defend the broad claim that people have the right to put whatever they want into their bodies, then they have lost the nuance that comes with defending medical marijuana. In that moment, they were defending much more than legalization of pot. Now they are defending the legalization of any drug or any technology, no matter how ethical. If your proposal is really about medical marijuana, then support for your proposal and the claims that you make for that proposal must be nuanced. You would be surprised at how difficult this is to do in practice. It is a common assumption that debaters should focus on the most powerful values, such as freedom, liberty, individual rights, etc. My theory is that those terms are powerful, but they don't carry much nuance. For example, if someone argues that individual rights must be preserved and therefore we should legalize medical marijuana, then they've opened themselves up to opponents finding any individual liberty that they believe is negatively affected by the claim that we should legalize all drugs. For example, if someone argues that addiction at its core removes the capacity of a person to enjoy their liberty because that addiction renders them incapable of making rational choices, then it might be difficult to defend the legalization of heroin. So if I was debating someone that attempted to justify the legalization of marijuana based on a strong individual rights position, then I could use heroin as an example of why we should not legalize drugs in the name of individual freedom. My opponent will quickly point out that marijuana does not have the addictive properties of heroin. But that's not the point. The problem for my opponent is that they did not defend a narrow claim about the legalization of marijuana. They defended the broader defense of individual rights, which does justify a person putting anything into their bodies, including heroin. I hope you can see that the more nuanced position would have been to argue that in the context of medical treatment, 
medical marijuana represents a pain relief system that can alleviate suffering for a narrow set of patients. If those patients are able to secure a prescription from a doctor that says the risks associated with medical marijuana are not as severe as the potential pain relief that it would provide, then a person should be allowed to use medical marijuana. If this proponent went one step further and said that medical marijuana should only be legal to people who have two separate doctors agree with the prescription, then that would be an added layer of nuance designed to create a qualifier. In other words, every condition we add to the original proposal reduces the number of extraneous arguments that my opponent can attack me on. In my experience, using the tools and procedures of debate as a method to both construct and defend proposals is powerfully effective in developing this nuance. When I do my consulting, I often find that my clients struggle to develop nuance because a controversy is never as simple, clean, or unencumbered as the client's original argument would suggest. It is simple to say we should legalize medical marijuana. It is more nuanced to say we should legalize medical marijuana for patients who have a prescription. It is even more nuanced to say we should legalize medical marijuana for patients who have a prescription that is supported by a second opinion. Although there is a value in simplicity, what ends up happening is that over the course of arguing about the proposal, my clients discover the potential weaknesses before they walk into the room. If they can add the nuance to the proposal from the outset, then they are far more successful in the boardroom or in front of the decision makers. Nuance is a sign to the audience and the judges and decision makers that you are well prepared and bringing forward a thoughtful proposal. Imagine it this way. If you are the decision maker and you have to have someone walk into your office and say, our employees should get a raise, then you have lots of opportunity to question this person from a variety of perspectives. You could start with, why should they get a raise? You could then ask, is this person defending that everyone should get a raise regardless of performance? You could then ask, where this person proposes to get the money for these raises? You get the point. If this person walked into your office and said, we've lost three employees from sales this quarter because our main competitor offers 3% higher commissions, can we consider matching that 3% or some other form of additional compensation to help prevent losing our best people? That is the person you want to talk to. Sure, you are going to have lots of questions, but at least you know that this is a competent employee who doesn't want to waste your time. Okay. We have covered some key concepts that will hopefully serve as a framework for you as you go forth and develop some excellent cases. If you find yourself focusing your arguments on the specific audience to the debate, doing research to support your positions, and making your arguments as nuanced as possible, then you need to be very careful. You might just be becoming a debater. <laughs>